Tyrol, thank you for coming on another Friday to the seminar. Like today, Bernard Mott is going to present uh, his work. Uh, now uh, he's currently working in the Ecology and Evolution Group, I think. So uh, I think that uh, he's uh, explaining a little about the work that he previously did before starting in Imedea. And well, thank you very much for collaborating. Now it's working. Your turn. Thank you. Right. So thank you. Uh, so yes, now we're doing a species research, but my background, what I'm talking today is something I did during my thesis, and that was with fish, but it wasn't fisheries, so I'm currently learning a new discipline. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about this today because it's uh, some molecular methods are widely applicable to just anything that's biological. So it doesn't matter if you work with animals or plants or bacteria, they have DNA, they have RNA, and they have proteins. So these methods measure that. And well, what I hope that you get out of this talk is that, um, well, since they're so widely applicable, that you'll come out of this talk with questions on how to apply it to your own research. And well, I didn't even mention that in the title, but it's about fish. Because I didn't mention it because I think it should be applicable today. Uh, right, so it's about fish, and even worse, it's about agriculture, so it's about fish production. And more specifically, it is about this fish, which is the rainbow trout, and that was the subject of my thesis. And as you can see, those are millions, so 20 million euros worth of revenue in Scotland, and then Norway is a bit better. But why does that matter, since Atlantis salmon is so much bigger, so why even bother with rainbow trout? And by the way, um, that this, what you buy in the shop, it all comes from there. So the salmon that you're buying, uh, whatever, in the supermarket, most likely it comes from Norway. And right, so why bother with rainbow trout if we have Atlantic salmon? They're basically very similar. Uh, some people can tell the, tell the difference. I think they taste the same. So why do we need it? And the answer is we don't, but if we want to give it a reason, it's about variety. So for the customer, you, when you go and buy meat, uh, there's different kinds of meat, so you have the variety to choose from, and customers seem to, allow, seem to like that. In Scotland or in, in the UK, those are the fish that you normally find. So there's not that much variety, and the rainbow trout is just something else to choose from. And that's the whole motivation for this. Uh, then there's quite a few problems in aquaculture. They cost millions and millions. Uh, the main one is the sea lice, which is a, a wee crustacean. It's a parasitic crustacean that attaches to the fish and it eats the flesh. And then it's a focus of infection and it causes so many problems. It's, it's a bit like the devil. And in aquaculture, everyone hates it. And then there's the harmful algal blooms, which I think some people here work on it. I think uh, Maria and Sara and Marco, but they're not here. And basically when they appear, uh, they kill everything because the fish can't breathe. So you have mass mortalities. And then there's my problem or the problem that I was treating in my thesis. And it has to do with this part of the life cycle of a salmonid. So, you know, they, they are born in fresh water and then they migrate to seawater because there's more food and it's a risk taking strategy. So they invest, so they, they take that risk that they're more likely to they're more likely to die. But at the same time, if they manage to survive, they'll get bigger and the, their reproduction will be better. And the important part is the important bit is here, uh Scotch multiplication. So that's that's a series of changes that pre-adapts a freshwater fish to life in free water in, in seawater. So when you see that, that fish is a freshwater fish, but it's more adapted to seawater than freshwater. And then, of course, there's a crucial step there. Uh, if this were wild fish, they would naturally migrate. So they would just think, well, they wouldn't think it, but they would naturally migrate to seawater when they're ready. That's not the case in aquaculture. In aquaculture, you provide that, and you say, you're probably ready, and you chuck them all in seawater and see what survives. Uh, in salmon, if they're not ready, they die. In rainbow trout, they don't die, 
but of course they are they don't get the run the the ground running. So they stay smaller than the other ones, then you get higher keys, and the bigger ones won't let the smaller ones eat. And they just they either die or they stay small and slowly die. So it's not a great life for them. And that was the phenotype that was studying in my thesis or part of it. <laughs> And that's the problem. That's what I'm talking about. There's, normally, there's a 10% that die quite quickly after seawater transfer. And then there's another 10% that stay like that, just looking like a pitiful fish that doesn't do much. And the problem there is that you can't sell them, because who wants to buy this? So what we did, uh, we had quite a few studies. And what we did for this one that I'm presenting today is we had the samples from other studies and we decided to reanalyze them because we saw that we actually had this, we had the good fish and we had the bad fish in some of our experiments. So we recovered that and we reanalyzed it. Uh, so I did my PhD in Scotland and I had my fish in Norway. Uh, that was half funded by the University of Bergen. And that's where we had the fish in Norway. I absolutely hated Norway. It's, it's a miserable place. I don't want to go back. And those are the fish. Uh, I, I don't know exactly when. I think this is soon after seawater transfer, and you can already see some fish that are bigger than the other ones. And that's what you see here. So this is from another experiment. And what you see there is how long the fish are and you know, time. Uh, so we're tracking the fish. We were marked so we know the identity of each fish and the thin lines are individual fish the thick lines are the average and what was interesting here well here we were testing photoperiods and seeing if they grow differently and some immune parameters and seeing how photoperiod affects the fish and if they at the end of the day if they are better or not for, for selling and we saw that we had in the distribution at the end of the seawater stage we had bigger fish and we had this, this close planted fish that, um, well, that are the problem in this industry. So we decided to take the samples and analyze them to characterize where might this phenotype come from. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's mostly methods. And the way I'm going to present it is I'll show you the method, I'll explain a bit the basics on how. The method works and how it works to measure things. And then I'll show you the results in my paper that used each method. So the first one is spectrophotometry. It's a super old method. It's from the 40s. And the way this works is you have a light source, and that light source goes through a prism, which divides it in visible light. And then with this lit, you will choose the wavelength that you're interested in. And then it goes through your sample and it's detected. So what you can know here is how much light is absorbed by your sample because whatever's not detected and was emitted is what the sample absorbed. So if you know what wavelength your protein or nucleic acid or whatever is absorbing and the proportion in which doing it, you can estimate how much sample you got. And we did that with a it's a, it's a very classic uh, test, which you use to, so you want to know the activity of the sodium potassium pump in the gills of the fish, which is a good estimate of how ready they are for seawater, uh, how competent they are in osmotic regulation. So basically knowing that salt water won't kill them. And it was quite a, uh, it's quite a smart method. So you, you add all these reagents there, the top ones, those ones, and you measure you measure how the reaction works. So what you're actually measuring in this is NAD formation. And because it's a one-to-one -one relationship, if this uh, the NKA is working properly, you'll get more and more NAD. So you what you did is you put that the sample in a machine that measures the abundance of NAD every three seconds. And with that, you get a slope. And that slope basically is the activity of the NKA, NKA or the abundance of it in the gill of a fish. And that's the result. 
so as you can see there, uh, there's no differences, so nothing here. And uh, then, well, I should explain a bit more, but basically there's no differences. The, the reason why the fish don't grow is not to do with osmotic stress, which I'll be into this. Then I'll explain the ELISA. It's also an old method. Um, and it has to do with this protein antibodies that are on the cell wall of immune cells. And they're, so this, these antibodies, they'll, re they'll recognize uh, antigens or pathogens, they'll attach to them, and then they'll signal other immune cells to come and kill whatever's the pathogen, or it doesn't need to be a pathogen even, it can be anything. And that's the advantage here. So you can you can engineer antibodies to attach to pretty much anything. And so you can buy kits that are ready for identification of cortisol, for example. This was my case. So let's imagine that this square tape here is a well in this 96 well plate. So you have it, you buy it like that, it's coated with antibody, and what you do is you put in your blood plasma from the fish, and that blood plasma will have many molecules, some of them cortisol, and you let it do its thing. It will attach to the antibodies, you remove the medium, and then you add a new one with more antibody. Only this time it's conjugated to an enzyme which will attach to the cortisol, whatever's not attached is removed. And then you add another one with this colorigenic substrate that when it attaches to the enzyme, it emits light. And that's all you do. You measure light, you see how much light is there, and obviously it's proportional to the amount of sample that you've got. So it's quite, I think it's beautiful engineering of taking advantage of a biological process for measuring something that you're interested in. And we did that. And so cortisol is, is a hormone that is normally uh, released um, when you're stressed. And we tested that, we saw, we checked if they were more stressed in fresh water, no, in seawater, probably not. I uh, have to say that cortisol is not great for measuring chronic stress, it's more for acute stress. So really it's not. We can't be sure that they weren't stressed. In fact, I'm pretty sure they were stressed, but we couldn't measure it with this. Uh, with the same method, also with ELISA, we measure insulin growth, insulin-like growth factor one, which is a, also a hormone that's related to growth in pretty much everything. And we did see something happening here. So they were fine in fresh water, but then something happens when you transfer them to seawater and they have less of this IGF-1, so they grow less, which you know, it's a result, but it's highly expected. And now I'll explain the PCR. Um, it's a bit boring to explain, so I'll be quick. Uh, but PCR is an amplification method. So what you can do is, if you have a, an amount of sample with DNA, you can amplify it to detectable levels. And then with PCR, you'll be able to answer a yes, no question. So is it present? Yes, no. With qPCR, you're able to answer that question. Is it present? Yes. And how much? So you can quantify it. And it also takes advantage of a natural process, which is the replication of the duplication of DNA by the polymerase. And I'll just quickly explain a bit how it works. It's all controlled by temperature. So PCRs are like little ovens that control temperature. You can increase the temperature to 24 degrees and the strands of DNA will separate. So these are strands of DNA. Uh, they separate into certain strands, single strands. And then you have your primers, which you design specifically to amplify the gene of interest that you've got. So they will attach to whatever you tell it to attach to the sequence here. So you have the complementary sequence of the, of the primer, and this will tell the, the polymerase that it has to attach there. And from there, it has to amplify. And those are, those are the primers that I used. So just so you see it, they are small sequences of DNA that attach to your main sample and tell the polymerase, okay, so this is where you want to start and with the extension phase. 
you see that polymer is there, uh, there doing its thing. And what it does is it picks nucleotides and one by one, it adds them to the template, so to the strand, making the complementary template. And, you know, you have, before you had two, now you have four. And repeat, and repeat, and repeat many times. And well, that's the chain reaction, right? So you have you start with one or whatever. For each one, you get two, four. So with each cycle, you get, you get two to the end. And really, that's the beauty of it. That's that's the beauty of, the, of yeah. this method. That because the formula is this one, you very quickly get high amounts of DNA that you can measure. And it's a super useful method. We know. It was used uh, for COVID, and that's how most people got to know, to know about it. But it's been used for years and years. And what you can also do is, if you're not interested in, in DNA, but in RNA, which is more dynamic and is already a response of the cell rather than just static like DNA, you can turn RNA into cDNA in a very similar process and then just do a normal PCR. And here we tested several genes, and we saw the same thing, really. IGF-1, again, it's, before it was a protein, here it's the RNA that precedes the protein. So, okay, fine, we have this result, and we know that. So, we know osmotic stress is not doing much. Chronic stress might be uh, not those genes other than IGF-1. So, really, we got nothing, and you're left feeling like this as a TST student because you're, <laughs> you know, you're, feeling, you're thinking I can't publish this because it's, it's not worth it. So what do you do? And you do omics. So when you're lost, you do omics. Uh, and what is omics? Well, there's a few examples there. So, but basically it's this. <laughs> that is omics. And I'll explain why. <laughs> so let's say um, you're using a targeted method like a PCR and you want to know how many goats are in your sample. And so your prior would be for goats and fine, you cut those goats. Could be the same with geese. With untargeted methods, with, with omics, you don't aim. And you think, oh, that's worse. It can be worse, but so it's like a shotgun. You, you shoot in the dark, right? And you hit something. And there you, you hit a deer, fair enough, but then you hit again, and there's a giraffe, and then there's a whale in the mountains, right? And it's, that's the point of it, that you get very unexpected results when you're lost. And so you get a new idea on what to, what to study further. So you, you find pathways that you never thought about, and they're actually implicated in whatever process or treatment. Uh, that your, your study is about. So that's what I did, uh, and I mostly did proteomics, uh, which I consider my thing, it's, it's what I really like. Um, and so we had five fish per group. I don't know what there's, there's only four there. We had five, and the ecologist will say just five, but that's normal. And five is, is a decent sample size, especially when Everything is so expensive. So just to do this, I think it was 4,000 pounds, which is not that much, but we did 10 fish and that was 4,000 pounds. Uh, so you can't have huge sample sizes. And you see that, and that table, so they're different and they grow different. Uh, so these are the back ones and those are the ones. There's a lot of lab work involved and Right, so you go through that, the lab work, and at some point before you spend, so this kit was 3,000 uh, pounds. So before you do that, you test the quality control of the of your samples just to make sure that everything's good. And then you do that. That's, at the time, it was quite a, a new method um, for proteomics. And I'll explain why. But basically here, so you have your 10 fish, and in each pair, in each sample, you put one of these labels. And this label will attach to the proteins in your sample at a molecular level that I can't quite understand. Uh, and it will mark it. So you, you can then mix all of these tubes that you get separated because they're different samples and you should never mix samples. Well, you're supposed to mix them. And it's scary. It's a scary thing. You do that. And then 
The beauty of it is you, you only have to run it once. Well, before that, I'll explain. So this is a mass spec. This one, this will be a, ma a Maldi. They have one at week. And I forgot to say, um, that was the first one what I showed here. This is an orbital. And you guys have an orbital. Mm -hmm. So these are things that you can do if you know how to use the machine and it's ready for it. Uh, the way it works. So you have, you have here, this is where you load your sample. And there's something that hits the sample. sample. In the Maldi, it will be a laser that blasts the, the sample. In the Orbitrap, it's an electrospay ionizer. So whatever, something that takes the protein, it breaks it into peptides, and it ionizes them, it charges them, so they'll, roll, they'll run to the opposite part of the, of the tube, of this huge tube. And what you're measuring is how long does it take from the laser to the detection. And based on how long it takes, you know how big the molecules are. And that's all it is. That's all. Mass space are like huge scales that you use for measuring very tiny things. Um, so that's the result you get from the mass spec, and also that that is from the LC, the liquid, liquid chromatography. And you have to think of protein samples as very gooey, very attached together. So you want to you want to separate it as much as possible before you before it enters the machine. And what that does, that's uh, that's like a huge column that separates your sample based on size, based on affinity. There's there's many different possibilities, but each of those peaks in the spectrum would be a protein. What the mass spec does is it takes, for example, this peak and it hits it with a laser or the ionizer. And for each of those peaks, you get this. And with this spectrum of M to Z, so the, the, the time it takes, that's called mass to charge radio. So it's an estimation of how big they are. So you get one of those per peak here. And with this, you can sort of get an identification of what your protein is. But if you really want to identify it, you hit it again with, uh, with the laser. So for each one of those peaks, you have to hit it again with the laser, and you get that. And what's funny about this is that here are the, those are the tags that I put in each of my samples. And there's 10 tags here. You can barely see it for some of them because they are so close together. But it's it's like it's plotting a bar plot of your sample. So based on how they fragment, you know the identity of the protein. So you can know, okay, this is protein, whatever, a polypoprotein or whatever. And based on that, you can quantify it. And that is magic, really, because uh, the technical replicability of uh, of mass spec is bad. So you could you could run three technical replicates of the same sample and still get significant differences. Because it's it's so the technicals are not very good. So if you run it together with all the samples in one, you avoid that. You don't have a problem with replicability and you can easily compare your samples. So that's the magic of it. And so we got 100. 540 peptides, all that, and 132 quantified proteins, which is quite a few proteins, but not as many as you'd normally get if you weren't using this method. So you need the tags to attach to each protein. And then we were super stringent with the method because we knew it's not that good. So we want whatever we put in forward as truth, we want to know it's true, not something that we're doubting. So we were quite happy with 132 proteins. And I'm already skipping to this proteins as identified and measured. So here's a heat map of the abundance of the proteins and the fast growing phenotype and the, the low stunted. Yellow is more. And you well, can see the, all, all of these are significantly different proteins. And there's so many processes there. Uh, but also, that's the beauty of it. So you're you're given so many, so many proteins. And then from there, you have to find a story that makes sense. Uh, and there were many stories. You could, that's, that has to do with stress. And oh, there's, uh, so many of them have to do with metabolism. There's a few about starvation, which makes sense. So of course, they were starving. But the, the, 
the good ones or the, the ones we decided to focus on were to do with oxidative stress. So both this protein and this one have to do with removal or production of reactive oxygen species, which is oxidative stress. And then with a very similar method for the same machine, but not for proteins, uh, this time it was for lipids, and I won't talk about, about it so much because I didn't do this one. Uh, but basically, we got the same story only with lipids. And that was that we found many cardiolipins and many ceramides, which are membrane lipids of the mitochondrial membrane, and they are needed for energy creation. Um, so we were very surprised to, to see that two omics methods uh, were telling the same story. So we decided to go forward with that, and we published this paper. And yeah, so in the paper, we discussed that probably uh, the problem with the phase that were not growing had to do with some, that they were missing some lipids in their diet or the, that hierarchies were formed and the, the big fish wouldn't let the small fish eat. So the right thing to do would be to separate them according to, create them according to size. Well, that was one idea. This guy is a friend, uh, he did a PhD with me and he was doing some immune stuff. And then he, he started working as the, as the his health manager of a, a farm that did exactly that. It was seawater rainbow trout. And we kept in touch. And whenever I see him, he tells me what's, how, <coughs> what he's doing with his work. And he actually told me that he managed to fix it and it had nothing to do with my paper. It was, all they did was give it enough food so everyone can eat. Right, so, and, and it was simple as that. <laughs> uh, so I bought it. And yeah, that's just a picture that I like. So that's it. Any questions? Another question mm -hmm. um, about the, the sample size. Of the, <coughs> so you have super sufficient in five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said okay, it's very costly. All right. So how do you check the if statistically your know, sample is representative of your original distribution, right? Yeah. Not only because uh, so five was. It's not much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it was enough to get significant differences. So say you have ten, then many proteins that were on the fence of being significant would have become significant, which is good enough with it. Actually, I had to get a project just to do this because my funding wasn't enough. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, statistically, I don't think there was a problem. Uh, to be fair, I didn't even bother with the what's that, strength, statistical strength, test, because it's, it's, it's what everyone does in proteomics or even a few of, how many samples did you use? Hmm? For what? I did it for a time. Yeah, well, I used 30, but they were not replicates. Right. So it was not the same. Mm -hmm. But normally, yeah, normally in transcriptomics, it's at least three biological three. replicates. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's, uh, I could have done three. I knew that but we went with five. And, you know, it's in that world, it's normal. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with that answer. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, it's um, yeah, three to five. You can, you can, if statistically the difference is not too really, it's not, if it's not significant, why bother and, and spend a thousand pounds yeah. more, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, if it's not enough to reach some, some, something conclusive, then why bother? But yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I think it, I'm quite it, happy with it. Yeah, it looks silly like this, but one fish more, he said it's, it's super expensive, so I guess mm. you can optimize this a lot. Also, uh, so, uh, with this, with the, this kit, you can get it up to 11 packs, but not more. You could, then you you could uh, say the beauty of it is that you run it together, but there's only 11 packs possible. So you can only have 11 uh, different samples. What you could do is have a pool of samples and have that pool. And so you run 10 with that pool and then another 10 with that pool and you compare it with the pool, but then you lose something. It's, a, it's not as, Good and it's much more complicated. And we did that for another study, but I'm not the first author of that one. But it worked, it worked well. 
but we couldn't be able to do the analysis ourselves. It was so complicated that we had to hire a company to do it. I don't know the question. No, the question. It can you just the graphs that uh, because I watch the color box, then the dots, then the horizons and lines um, of the all the graphs that you put on the differences between the phosphorine species. Oh, this one. The... No. No, no, it's four, right? The plot. Doing this. No, no, no. Way before. Way yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. You say stop. Um, oh. oh, you mean this one? No, no, no. So it was parallel. Sorry, I cannot see. Well, maybe. Okay, these these kind of graphs. What's the horizontal lines? What what are right? Them. Yeah, sorry, then. Uh, so that's the variable that I was that I was talking about, and uh, by spectrophotometry. So that's what we measure, and I should have said. Uh, so you see how. You measure the activity of this. So the activity of the NKA is measured as micromoles of ADP per milligram of protein per hour. So that's that's activity of the pump. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's because this you could say anything I would be like, okay. The the typically the graph, like the what's the horizontal lines, what are the dots, what is the blue box, what is the horizontal top line? What's this representation? You're, you're not used to that. Right. So that's, well, that's a sublime plot, right? That's the deviation. Those are samples. Yeah. That will be an outlier. And that means it's not significantly different. The, the horizontal line? This, this is just the tell from here to here. There's no difference. Oh. <laughs> and actually, I could even, I could explain this with a bit more detail because I have it this. It looks like a box plot, but it's not a box plot. Which, uh, no, but it's a bar plot. Uh, no, it's a bar plot. Uh, but that basically tells the same story. Uh, so I was talking about the pump, right? The pump that I'm talking about is the red one. Uh, so that would be a juvenile fish, fresh water. That's a fish that's almost ready for seawater. And you can already see some some of those, those cells of the cells that have this protein uh, showing up, and then in seawater, they only have the red one. Uh, this method is called in situ hybridization. I think it's super cool. So it lets you, it's like a PCR on image. So you can know where is your gene expressed. So you could get a cut of sample and then see where that gene is, well, is transcripted into RNA. I think it was. I also didn't do this one. I took this from, from a publication. Anything else? No? Yeah. Based on your study, is there a link between fishes which have leaks or lice on them or uh, and uh, chronic stresses? Yeah. yeah. I didn't look at that because my fish were in the lab, so they had more lice. Uh, but yeah, probably I, actually I had a few bonus slides just in case. Uh, so the reason I said that uh, cortisol is not good for chronic stress here, this is where uh, cortisol is good at. So you want at the beginning of a stress when it's still acute, uh, the cortisol response is measurable, but then at some point the animal just gives up. Physiologically, it just gives up and uh, the cortisol goes back down. And I think what we measured was here. So this cortisol is not good for chronic stress, it's only for the key. Uh, answering your question, I'm pretty sure they are more stressed if they have sea lice because uh, it's a painful experience. They, they get wounds. Or is it the other way around? Like if they have stress, then they get eat like lice on it. If they are weaker, they're, they're more likely to, to get lice. Yeah, so the, the small fish, the low standard fish would be very likely to, to have lice. And when you saw them in the uh, in the industry, they would just sort of be floating there and then they would catch them to the nets and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> no, I have a curiosity. Mm. Um, 
which proteins did you um, analyze from all the omics thing that you get? Uh, so we. Well, the, my question is is related to um, which specific protein you have to uh, just measure or analyze for knowing this this type of stress, and maybe the same proteins could be analyzed for another uh, uh, study that is similar like this. Right, so uh, you don't know what you're looking for when you're doing proteomics. You just see what's there. And because we have five on five, you could do statistical tests and see what's different. And that's the, that the, that the heat map that I showed you. I think it had 19 proteins. And we focused on those ones that were, we knew they were different. We didn't bother with the, the other hundreds that were not significantly different because that was not the response. That was not the, the explanation. So I don't think I'm answering your question. What, can you... Yeah, well, my first question it was like this, but the other is like, okay, if maybe if you are uh, analyzing a community that is a stress uh, for another thing, not the same that you were studying, maybe you could do the same analysis, or maybe you need to focus to specific proteins to do that. Yeah, uh, but you do all mix when you don't know what to focus on. You have, you have no idea, you're lost. You <laughs> might as well just find something new. Uh, but yeah, you could do that. Yeah. And if you wanted to just look at one protein, you could do one of those methods that I explained. You could do Western blocks, which is a common one. Yeah. All right. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.